And pediatricians are the nicest people until we want to give you a shot. <laughs> and then we're, then we're public enemy number one. So um, this, is my, this is my first time um, down here to do this. And I'm doing it. I'm not a public speaker kind of person. And um, I'm doing it because I really um, I have a heart for students. And, and when Rich told me about the mentor program, it's something that I really strongly believe in. I think mentors are really important. Um, and there are a lot of people along my path that, you know, to this day are incredibly important to me. I still keep in touch with. So um, that's why I'm here. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Illinois Champaign-Urbana in 1988 with a bachelor's degree in biology. And then I went on to the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine. <laughs> Got my MD degree in 1992. And then I finished my pediatric residency in 1995 at what's now the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital, but it used to be Weiler Children's Hospital, so I still call it Weiler because that's what it was when I was there. Um, and I'm working right now in a um, single specialty, so a general pediatric practice. This is a private practice in the northwest suburbs of um, Chicago and Arlington Heights. Um, and I've been doing that for 19 years. But I will also say I have a secondary career, and that's being a mom. Um, a stepmom, actually, and a wife. Um, so I have two careers. Um, but anyway, um, you know, I will probably say some things during this talk. Some are good and, and, and some may be bad, but I just want to say, why would you want to study medicine? I mean, that's sort of where I, I want to start. And to me, um, you know, my, my number one reason is I think the human body is this remarkable machine. Um, I think it provides one of the most fascinating areas that you could possibly study. Um, and just for a small example, if you guys, if anybody's taken embryology, um, you know what it takes, um, you have a sperm and an egg, and all the steps and processes that happen to make a human is incredible, and it's amazing that we actually get normal, healthy babies out of that if you study it. Um, medicine allows you, you know, into people's lives in a way that you never get into, in, into people's lives. You see them at their most vulnerable. Um, and and um, that's a special thing. Um, it also puts you in a position to do very small things that seem like very big things to your patients. And one of those things in pediatrics that we do is reduction of a nursemaid elbow. It's probably something that takes about five seconds to do, but it makes parents very, very happy. Um, you get a little kid coming in who's screaming their head off and not moving their arm. You manipulate um, the arm just a little bit, and all of a sudden, they're happy in the arms moving around. The parents think you're the greatest person on the planet. <laughs> um, and I think that medicine is just, um, for people who like to be intellectually challenged, it's always changing. And like you've heard from some of the other speakers, all the new developments and things that are happening. So there's, there's the potential for constant um, lifelong learning. Um, so that I think that's another way. And one of the practical things of why you would want to study medicine um, is that I think it really does provide job security. I mean, it's a very sketchy job market. And I can tell you guys, I still get probably like two emails a week for someone looking for a general pediatrician. So there's always opportunities out there. And you do make a comfortable living. Um, so that's a practical part of it. So um, how did I choose Illinois um, to come to school? And uh, I was talking to Dr. Berkowitz about this. I said, I was pretty clueless because nobody in my family really had gone to college um, except for my father, who had gone on a football scholarship, which was not translatable for me at all because <laughs> I wasn't going to be playing for the Fighting Illini. So, um, and then I also had financial constraints in my family, too. So I was, I was limited to in-state schools. And actually, at that the time that I was going to school, Illinois was well known for its top rate, which it still is, public education. Um, so that's why I, I chose it. But one of the things I would say to you guys is that no matter where you go, I really feel like you get, in, you get out what you put in. And so there's, this campus has plenty of opportunity. And sometimes you just need to, to get on the ball and start seeking out those opportunities um, because there's so much that, that you can get out of a place if you, if you put the, the time in. Um, and I love this school, and I would do it again. So um, why did I choose biology? I have a bunch of questions. Like, why did I choose this? Why did I choose biology? Um, my, I was always a math science person in high school. Um, really hated history and English. And, and so you know, I always kind of knew I was going to do something along those lines. And science was really prob probably my favorite. 
And when I was um, contemplating what to major in, I was kind of between biology and chemistry. And then my AP chemistry teacher happened to me and gave me <laughs> horror stories of <laughs> organic chemistry lab and how it was, you're going to run these experiments and then they were going to go wrong and then you know, you're going to fail. And, but I had to take it anyway <laughs> for my major. So it really didn't matter. But um, I ended up choosing, um, choosing biology. And at the time that we were here, actually biology was part of the, uh, it was School of Life Sciences was what it was called when we were here. Um, so um, one of my partners wanted me, and, and, and all apologies to the MCB people, but one of my partners wanted me to tell you guys, you don't have to study biology or a science to go to medical school. Um, because my one partner is actually, she was an anthropology major and a theater minor. So <laughs> she wanted me to let you guys know that. Um, but we, and then we were having this great debate too, does it really matter if you're, for medical school if you're a biology major or not? And, and it really doesn't. I mean, her feeling was it absolutely didn't. I mean, I think it made the first year of medical school, I'll be honest, I thought the first year of medical school was easy. <laughs> People might think that that's crazy, but I really did. Um, but it did kind of give me the opportunity um, to help people in my class because um, there were some courses for me that I was sort of repeating like immunology and, and um, anatomy and um, second time around you know more light bulbs go on um, and it, it was just easy to help um, other people in the class. It didn't make any difference after that I would say for you know for me. Um, things I remember about the University of Illinois. Um, part of the cluelessness again you sit down with your academic advisor um, to come up with what's your schedule um, going to be. And they say to me, do you like math? Well, yeah, I like math. I had already tested out of all the math, but they're like, oh, if you like math, you should sign up for Math 242. <laughs> so, <laughs> calculus of multiple integrals. So I walk into the class as a first semester freshman. I am one of three females. And everybody else is like, except for my, my other friend, Fiona, who is in class, we're, we're engineering majors. And I'm thinking, what in the world am I doing in here? Um, but I think the thing I learned from that class is it, it made me face a fear and a challenge. And it actually gave me a lot of confidence in my academic ability because I actually ended up doing well in the class after walking in, you know, shell-shocked. Um, I had a professor in immunology, and um, his name was Dr. Roderick McLeod. And actually, immunology here was my favorite. It was my favorite my class. Class. Your worst class. Your worst class. I love that class. Um, and he always had these little sayings. He would always give to us. But one of the first things, the very first day of class, that he said to us, he's like, and he had this brogue accent too, which I can't do. But he said, you know, I'm going to give you the foundation, and you must build the building. And what he really taught me was you need to take what you know and apply it. Not just, you know, memorize it and regurgitate it, but actually take it and, and see what you can do with it. And his class was actually, and you guys are going to think I'm crazy again, but his class was one of the classes that I actually enjoyed taking tests in. Because none of his tests were a regurgitation test. It was like, you'd sit there and be like, okay, well, what is he getting at with this question? And like, when you would figure it out, I mean, that would be very satisfying, you know, to, yeah, I know, I know how to use this stuff. Um, one of my other um, classes that I really enjoyed that was totally outside the whole um, science thing was Italian, because I had a crazy Italian teacher um, who would actually come up to you on the quad if he saw you jump up behind you and go, Ciao, Melissa, come stai? You know, and, and we had parties and, and <laughs> ate a lot of Italian food. And the other thing that he did too is he, he had a very different teaching method. And when we walked in, he's like, he's like, throw the books away. We're like looking at him like, what? Throw the books away? Yeah, when you were a baby, did you talk first or did you read first? And we said, we talked first. Um, so it was just kind of his, his, um, different methods of learning, and then also to just to like enjoy life, because he would always tell me, Senior Ina Melissa, you think too much. You will never have fun in your life, you know? <laughs> so, so he was kind of the one that, you know, made me, made me you know, you, got, you can be serious, but you gotta have, ha, gotta have a little bit of fun too. And then I actually worked in a, in a lab here, um, and actually I worked in the Department of Neuro and Behavioral Biology, which kind of, was kind of a cross between biology and psychology. And I liked that experience too, because all the personalities in the lab were very different, so it was learning how to, you know, collaborate with people that just don't always think the same way that you do. Um, so I enjoyed that. And then, um, speaking back to the organic chemistry, <laughs> Um, I had organic chemistry lab on Friday afternoon, 1 to 4. It was a very lovely, lovely spot to have it. 
Um, and so we spent a lot of time in that lab and I got to know my organic chemistry TA pretty well and we sort of became friends outside of the class, which was kind of neat then because I lived in FAR and I really didn't like to walk back there. Um, so I could go hang out in his lab um, in, be in between classes. He was in Roger Adams' lab. And you, you were able to learn things from the graduate students that I wouldn't really been learning from class because they'd sit there and chalk out things on the board for me and tell me what they were doing in their lab. Um, so that was kind of another fun learning experience that I had here. Um, so why did I choose medicine? Um, it's a, it's a very, strange, very strange story. I think in the eighth grade they had asked us um, when they were doing yearbooks, what do you think you're going to be um, you know, when you grow up? And I said, you know, I'm going to be a pediatrician. Um, which, of course, it, then after I was in high school, I had all these different ideas about what I was going to be doing, um, and medicine wasn't one of them. And then obviously coming from a background of people who didn't really go to college, I actually didn't think I was smart enough to go to medical school. I mean, honestly, came in and said, you know, I don't, I don't think that, that I'm that person. But then I started to meet a lot of the other students who were <laughs> just happy <laughs> that I would go to medical school and seriously said, if this person, he can do it, I can do it. So, <laughs> so that was a little bit of it. And we had an opportunity, which I don't know if you had this opportunity, but we had some... Had, we're old, so but there was something called the Michael Reese Introduction to Medicine program. Did you have that? No. So there was this program that Michael Reese Hospital, which doesn't exist in the city of Chicago anymore. Uh, yeah. But um, the doctors there decided, you know, mentorship is important and people getting a view of medicine, you know, before they really decide that that's what they want to commit their lives to. Um, so we were allowed to interview for it, I think, during the junior year. And so the summer of junior year, um, if you got into the program, um, you were able to rotate with doctors in different specialties. So we were with a surgeon and an obstetrician gynecologist. Um, I, d I was with an endocrinologist pediatrician, um, you know, so you kind of had the whole summer of doing that to get an idea if you really wanted to do it. Um, so I think that that was um, something that was very helpful. And then I think other people touched on this too. I just wanted to say, you know, the process of what, what do you need for medical school? You have to take the MCAT. It's a horrible test. <laughs> um, and then, you, you know, your grade, there's your grades. Um, you do need the letters of recommendation. And then there's um, generally um, personal statements. I think now there's essay questions, but we had, you know, personal personal statement that we had to do. So those were some of the things that uh, you needed to needed to do. But I will tell you, I mean, I think you guys do a lot. I mean, like, I look at the people who get into medical school now, and I go, like, if I was applying today, would I really get in? Because you guys are doing so many other things that I wasn't even really, like, thinking about doing. So a lot of people have a lot of other activities and, and things that they've been involved in that probably, you know, feeds in somewhat to the, um, to the selection process. Um, I just wanted to say, when, when you look at medical school and residency, both of those are pretty um, intense experiences that you go through. So you really bond with the people that you're with. And I think the hardest thing for me was the leaving of both of those places because you had to leave these people that you were really close to behind um, and spread out, spread your wings, different, different places that we went. Um, so when I was going to... Um, when I was going to medical school, it's kind of like you go in with a thought like, well, what do I think I'm going to do? Um, I originally went in thinking I was going to become a psychiatrist. Um, and it's, when I was down here and I was involved um, in the psychology department in my research, I actually took a lot of psychology classes. And I really find the behavior and the mind and the brain very interesting. Um, but when... Um, I actually kind of got into what it would mean to be a psychiatrist. You do your clerkship rotation. I just sort of decided that that wasn't um, the thing um, for me. So just a little bit, and again, the programs are very different now than, than they were for us um, at the time. But we had what was called the M1 and M2 year. So it's your first two years of medical school. And basically, we sat in a classroom for two years <laughs> and took all, took all your basic courses. Um, and then at the end of the second year, we had a physical diagnosis course. So that was the first time that you actually started doing um, 
that you just started doing clinical work and that's different now. Um, and then during your M3 year, we went through the core clerkships, which were um, internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, obstetrics, gynecology, and psychiatry. And then your M4 year was, um, that was a free for all year um, because you could do your electives. It's a little, it's a little different. I'm gonna talk about some of the differences that I actually know, um, that I know about. And then um, you could also rotate at other medical schools. So you didn't have to stay at your medical school. You had uh, the opportunity to, to do electives at other medical schools. And then um, there's also this um, business of the USMLEs that you have to pass, step one, two, and three, which I couldn't remember what years we had to do all of those <laughs> after because it's been a while. But the step one is more the basic. Um, you do the basic sciences. And then step two is more clinical. And then I'd probably say step three is even more so because you take that during, I think, your first year of residency, if I, yeah, if I recall. Um, but I'm a member of something called the Medical Alumni Council at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And so I know that there's things that are different because we talk about them all the time. <laughs> um, and so our council meets about four times a year and we try to participate with the, with the medical students. We do things like their white coat ceremony and match day and they have a holiday party and commencement. So we're involved in those um, activities with them and it's really kind of a fun thing. Um, and the goal basically of this council is to keep the alumni connected to the college, the students collect, uh, connected to the alumni, um, and being kind of advocates for both the students and for the university. So that's our purpose. Um, I would say that what I know about medical school now is um, orient, there's much more organized orientation. We were like, these are your books, get the, these, this equipment, and class starts this day. Um, they have like about a week or so, it might be a, bit, might be a little bit longer, um, of an organized orientation. And they kind of do, I think, even like little um, relationship building um, projects and then they have something called the white coat ceremony which we didn't have which I think is really really neat um, it's a ceremony and they get presented their white coat you know you are now coming into medical school and and it's a pretty neat thing to be involved with um, there's more clinical opportunities in the M1 and M2 year um, and then um, you guys had more technology because everything we learned, we learned on patients. And now they have like fake, I'm gonna call them fake patients, but just things. I mean, we drew blood on each other. We examined each other. <laughs> um, you know, you, you learn things on patients for the first time. Thank you patients for my education um, in medical school. Um, but there's a lot more practicing that can happen um, on pretty realistic um, tools, te technological tools, so that's different. Um, and then there's more structure to the M4 year now where you kind of have to pick a track. So you have to pick like a hospital track, um, a primary care track, or a surgery track. Um, and then they've got way more organized preparation, I think, for the USMLEs than we ever had. Um, and I won't really get into the detail about that, but if you guys want to ask me about that later, I can talk to you about that. Um, and then I thought, just so you guys get a little taste of stuff, I have my fun and random facts from, from medical school. Um, my class had more men than women, so you know it was it was a different time. I mean, it's it's either pretty even, or maybe there's more. You know, there might even be more women now. Um, contrary to the popular belief that everybody in medical school was really competitive, I don't agree with that. My class was pretty close, um, and we really helped each other out a lot. Um, we got a bonfire after anatomy lab to burn all our smelly clothes. That was fun. Um, we had a skit night, and I don't know if they let us, they let them do that anymore, but it was kind of a, where we were allowed to kind of make fun of the whole process of medical school. Um, I can tell you stories about skit night too, but I won't get into that now. Um, we thought it would be fun because we were stuck in pathology labs so long that we would try different flavored coffees every week, and people would bring snacks. Um, most of my friends from medical school's last names end in D because we were in alphabetical order. Um, Cook County Hospital was the best place to do your rotations because they let students do everything there. Um, my general surgery attending called me Blondie the entire rotation. Um, I delivered nine babies by myself. Um, I was always the extra girl on the team for everything. Hey Mel, we signed you up for softball. We signed you up for volleyball. We need an extra girl. Um, so I had that a lot. Um, and we found everything free that was fun to do in the city of Chicago. Um, so now, um, why would you choose pediatrics? Why would you want to do pediatrics as, as your um, specialty? Um, pediatricians are happy people. We're also very loud people <laughs> and silly people. 
Um, pediatrics for me was always, a, I, I felt like in the rotation, it was a very nurturing environment. I always felt like the attendings in pediatrics were very invested in students doing well. Um, it fit my personality, probably. That's one of the reasons. Um, we're okay with being silly. Um, we don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, we talk about poop and pee and snots in our office. <laughs> um, working with children, I think, is far better than working with adults. <laughs> so, so I disagree. I disagree there. Um, I think there are easy solutions to kids' medical problems. Most of the time, you do see them getting better. Um, and it's a female-friendly environment, pediatrics is. Um, the residency interview uh, process, I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you decide where you want to interview, and then you would forward um, the required information and letter, letters of recommendations to the residency programs. Um, oh, I forgot what I want to say about this. <laughs> Well, most of the interviews were not really, I didn't really feel like, at least at the time when I was going, I'm, it's probably different now. A lot of it was the program was informing us about the program, but weren't necessarily asking us a lot about ourselves, except for the only interview I felt like was, I, I interviewed at Denver Children's Hospital. Um, I feel like they really asked me a lot of questions, because like, well, you're from Chicago, and all your family's in Chicago, you know, are you really going to be able to, you know, make a move like that? And I felt like they were really trying to get to know me to see if I would be a fit for the program. Um, and then it's a ranking system. So you rank the programs, the programs rank you, and then that's where the match comes in. I actually matched at my second choice. Um, my first choice was um, Children's Memorial, which is now Lurie Children's Hospital. It has a different name, too. Um, but I was happy with, you know, in the end, it wasn't my first choice, but I was happy um, where I ended up. Um, so I trained at the University um, of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital. It was a three-year program, and this is where the flip went in the male-female. My residency class was 20, 21 females. It was 24 people, 21 females and three males. Um, so the guys were the minority. Um, we had three hospitals that we rotated through. We rotated through the main university hospital, which is Comer. We did La Rabita Children's Hospital, and we did a... Um, a community hospital, which was Mercy. And I think that program's changed a little bit too, where I'm not sure that they're rotating um, at all in, at Mercy anymore. I don't, I, I don't know if they are. Um, so we had an orientation week for residency where we um, met you know, the residents that you're obviously gonna be working with. And then we had to do our neonatal um, advanced life support and pediatric advanced life support during that week. So we completed both of those. Get your IDs, your lab coats, all the stuff you need to, to do for um, residency. And then you've got three, three years, and each of the years we only had two weeks of vacation. So during your entire year, there's, there's a two-week vacation period. Um, and then we had monthly, we were on monthly rotations. So you kind of got your schedule for the whole year at the beginning of your year. And we were called PL1s, PL2s, and PL3s during residency. Um, so we had services, and the way that our services were set up is we had an A service, which was general pediatrics, endocrinology, neurology. Our B service was hematology, oncology. We had a C service, infectious disease, pulmonary, and cardiology. And then our um, D service was liver and GI service. And then you would do, we did pediatric surgery for two weeks. We had ER, um, PICU, NICU. Um, we had special care nursery and then just the regular floor at Mercy. And then we were at La, La Rabita, which was just uh, more of a chronic care hospital. Um, and then we had a weekly outpatient clinic. And mine was Fridays, Friday afternoon. <laughs> I was at everything on Friday afternoon. Um, but it was where you would have patients that were actually assigned to you, which was kind of nice because these families, I think the thing that was hard for them is every three years their doctor was changing. But at least for three years they would have the same um, physician. So you actually started to get get to know families in the community. Um, so that was nice. And then we had attendings that were, would supervise us during those, um, during clinic. Um, we had more electives during the third years. Um, we were on call every fourth night. Um, you generally would have on the services, you'd have a third year resident, usually with like two first year residents. Sometimes some of the residents would have more, you know, second years on them. Um, you had teaching responsibilities to the residents under you, but also to the medical students. Um, and then each year we had to take something called an in-service exam, which was to prepare us for the, um, for the actual pediatric board exam. And the expectation was every year you were gonna get, you were gonna get better. Um, and then you had, um, your kind of constants were your clinic attendings, because um, they were always with you for the three years. And then you had a faculty advisor. Um, so my fun and random facts about residency. 
My very first day and my very last day in residency were on call in the neonatal intensive care unit. I don't know how that worked, but it was kind of a circle. <laughs> um, my personal advisor was um, Dr. Bill Meadow, which if you guys ever see the um, Chicago's Best Doctors, um, he always shows up on the list for neo neonatology. Um, he was one of my favorite people and one of those mentor people that I was talking about. Um, but he would always buy us and Sather cinnamon rolls. I don't know if you guys know those, but they were great when you'd been on call to, to eat sugar. Um, <laughs> and he'd always like sing songs as we were making rounds and babies' names would remind him of songs. And so he'd go into song as we're moving from bed to bed. So that was always fun. And sometimes he'd randomly show up at 3 a.m. He could hear his, his uh, clogs coming down the hallway. <laughs> hey, how are things going? Came to check out the nursery, see how it's going. Um, we worked probably 90 to 100 hours a week, which is um, different now because there's residency hour limitations. And when we calculated our salary based on hours worked, we were making $2.25 an hour, so less than the minimum wage. Um, I thought I had a lot of outstanding attendings. I felt like I was really taught well. I really enjoyed my residency program. I love the intellectual environment of the tertiary care center, and I really miss it now, um, just because there's people of different specialties and being able to kind of talk and collaborate. And I love being able to call up on the phone and be like, I need a cardiologist, and they appear, you know, which does not happen in, you know, does not happen in private practice. Um, so when I was looking for jobs, it was actually pretty easy at the time because a lot of our attendings had attending friends that were general pediatricians who were looking for um, colleagues. So a lot of how I found out about jobs was through the attendings that I had. Plus we had headhunters calling us all the time, like appraisers going off outside call, outside call, outside call. It was the headhunters. So it was actually pretty easy, pretty easy for me. I think I, I interviewed at 15 different practices um, before I chose the practice that, that um, I initially was in. Um, so what is general pediatrics? Um, the formal definition of it is it's a specialty that focuses on the physical, mental, and social health of children from birth to 21 years. I like to say you're a jack of all trades but master of none because <laughs> um, we're the first line of defense and we figure a lot of things out but we aren't necessarily the people that go on to treat certain things um, because they're just more complicated. Um, why, what do I like about my job? Um, the intellectual stimulation for me, I, I'm kind of like the puzzle person. I like a challenge. I like to think about things. I like to put all the pieces together. Um, I like the diagnostic process. Um, I like figuring kids out because each kid is a little bit different and sometimes you know they're skittish or they're scared or whatever and I like figuring out what's going to work for that kid. So then when the parent leaves they say, wow, this was the best visit we've had. <laughs> you know, just kind of psychologically understand the kids. I like that. I like taking care of the families over time, getting to know the families, getting to know the kids. Um, you know, you, you see, I, I've seen kids now have kids and they're bringing their kids back to me, which is a really neat experience because you feel like they must have had a good experience with you because now they're bringing their child back to you. <laughs> Um, I like being silly and, um, and, and, and having fun because that's part of your job description as a pediatrician. I mean, I examine toys and we talk loud and you know, craziness goes on. We sing happy birthday in the office. You can, be, uh, you can dress up at, at Halloween and that's okay. People don't think you're a nutcase when you come to work <laughs> in a costume. Um, kids are pretty resilient. Most of the problems can be fixed. Um, you get drawings, paintings, jewelry, pictures, you know, I mean, we get those sorts of things on a regular um, basis. Um, I like being able to be in the position to educate people about how to be healthier. Um, and kids are honest until they become teenagers and look you straight in the eye and lie to you. Um, but the kids will say crazy, I mean, they'll say crazy things and they'll tell you just how it is. You know, Doctor, you really need a haircut. Or, you know, I like that dress you're wearing. So crazy things come out of them. Um, what I don't like, um, I, I actually don't like call, but what a surprise, <laughs> I don't like being on call. I think it's hard um, when, when you're getting information over the phone, it's not as easy to make decisions as it is when you actually have the person in front of you. So I feel there's like a little bit of a, a challenge there. And sometimes you will hear the story and you'll think it's the worst thing and you send the kid into the emergency room because you think this is bad. And on the ER guy, I'll be like, your kid is fine, your patient's fine. So it's hard to, hard to really know um, 
what's going on. So that makes me always makes me a little bit nervous. I hate the business aspects of running a practice, and I had no business experience when I um, when I went to medical school. And so everything I've learned about running a business has been on the fly, and I do not feel like I'm a great business person. Um, so I don't like that. And I also feel like the decisions you make as a business person are would often be in conflict with the decisions you would make as a physician, like taking care of somebody for free. Not so good for my business, but the right thing to do you know, as a doctor. Um, so that, and, and there's more opportunities now for you guys to do like combo degrees, like MD, MBAs, and things like that. I would almost say, you know, I think you want to take some business stuff, especially if you want to be in private practice, because otherwise you're going to feel like you're just very unprepared. Um, I hate when parents, like it's, it's hard when you feel like parents are making bad medical decisions for their children. That's a difficult, that's a difficult situation. Um, I don't like what I call abusive behavior when people swear and yell at you, because <laughs> that happens sometimes, especially when you're, when you're doing what, you, what is medically right, but they, it's not what they want you to do for their kids. Sometimes people can get a little crazy. Um, and I hate the insurance companies telling me what I can and can't do. That drives me nuts. Um, and what are our biggest challenges um, in pediatrics right now? I think the anti-vaccine movement is a big one. Um, I think the explosion of mental health problems and the lack of resources. Um, I think the obesity epidemic um, is another one because there's all kinds of diseases now that are coming up in children that they didn't used to have, like hypertension, type 2 diabetes, joint problems. Um, Teen confidentiality is tricky, especially when you're a mom, <laughs> um, because sometimes some of the things that kids tell me that I have to keep in confidence, if the kids are not going to hurt, I mean, it's not immediately dangerous to them, I have to keep in confidence. But if I was a mom, I would want to know those things. <laughs> so I find a lot of, a lot of conflict in that. Um, and then I think just that everybody thinks antibiotics fix everything. Um, and everybody wants a pill. Scott, are you listening to that? <laughs> everybody wants a pill. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that's one of the biggest battles we have. And most of it, I mean, I would say 98% of what kids get are viral, and it's going to get better anyway, but everybody thinks that the antibiotic is the magic thing. And now, you know, families are really, like, stressed out. Two parents are working. Kid needs to get back to school. If we just get the antibiotic, it's going to be better. Um, you know, so there's a lot of that that goes on. And so, like, you have to go back and sit down and educate, you know, like, well, this is why we don't want to do this, and, you know, this is a better choice, and that sort of thing. Um, so right now, I'm actually affiliated um, with a hospital called North West Community Hospital, which is in Arlington Heights, and, and we're affiliated with Lurie Children's Hospital, so we actually have a pediatric emergency room, we have neonatologists, and we have pediatric hospitalists. This makes my lifestyle really nice, because I never have to run into the hospital at night, which is great if you, you have a family. Um, so my practice has two offices, and we work in both offices. We have one in Arlington Heights and one in Lake Zurich. And um, we're five general pediatricians, and we all just happen to be fe female. Um, we had um, some male doctors. One um, started as, went off and started uh, a different practice, and the other one retired. So now we're just a, a group of five women. Um, our schedule, the, the interesting thing about pediatrics, there's a lot of seasonality to your schedule. So there's times when you're really, really busy and times when you're really, really slow. We happen to be really, really slow right now. <laughs> Um, schedule, uh, it, schedules in the summer are very busy because all kids have to get physicals for, if they want to participate in sports, you have to get one in the state of Illinois for um, kindergarten, sixth grade, and high school entry. Um, so we're busy doing that in the summer. And then winter, obviously, because of viral stuff, tends to be busier. Um, what do we do? Um, we basically do like three types of visits, physical exams, ill visits, and then consultations, which are maybe things like people are coming in to, to determine if their children have ADHD. Um, most of what we do, anticipat anticipatory guidance, um, most of the things that we see probably fall into infectious diseases, pulmonary, GI, dermatology, and orthopedics. Um, those are probably the most, most common areas that we, we see complaints in. Um, and full-time for us is four days a week, and we work two weekends a month. Um, and we're on call about six to seven times a month. Um, and um, the, I, there were three things I kept coming up when I was asking my colleagues, like what if you, know, you were at the position that you guys are in, what would you have wanted to know? Um, they said, you have to really like what you're doing because it's a big time, you know, I mean, it's, it's a time commitment. You have to understand the path and you have to understand the commitment. Um, they said that um, 
watch your debt. Everybody kept saying, watch your debt, watch your debt, watch your debt. That kept coming up. Um, and then just the work-life balance, because I know a lot of female um, physicians, and I will tell you, and I struggle with this too, there are times where it, you feel like, I'm not th being the greatest doctor, and I'm not being the greatest mom, and how do I like figure all of that out? Um, you know, for me, briefly, the solution for me was to cut down to three-quarter time, and it made my life a lot easier. Um, so I still was in it you know, in the medicine enough and feeling like I was doing a good job, but also feeling like I could attend to my family and, and their needs appropriately. So that's all I have. Okay. okay.